Now, a WYSN 12 News Commitment 2023 election special. The race for Supreme Court. One of the most powerful jobs in Wisconsin. I think this is going to be an election like no other. Everything people care about is at stake. A pivotal time, a critical decision. Voters determining the balance of the state's highest court. Is this the way Supreme Court races should be conducted? What do you think is the most pressing issue before the court? Issues that dramatically affect everyday life. Let's get away from the extremism. Let's get away from the partisanship. The one thing that I do know is people of Wisconsin know how to amend their constitution. Tonight, the candidates are on the record with upfront hosts, Jaron Jordan and Matt Smith. Good evening. Tonight, one of the most watched races in the country playing out right here in Wisconsin, the battle for state Supreme Court. It is a nonpartisan race in name only, and the lines have been clearly drawn. Daniel Kelly is a conservative, a lawyer who former Governor Scott Walker appointed to the Supreme Court in 2016. He ran for the seat in 2020, but lost. Janet Protasewicz is a liberal, also a lawyer, a prosecutor in Milwaukee County for 25 years, a sitting circuit court judge since 2014. 12 News invited both candidates to a live televised debate. Kelly accepted, Protasewicz declined. Now we are committed to issue center discourse, so we agreed instead to in-depth interviews. So we'll spend the next 30 minutes on the record with both candidates, no questions off limits. We begin with former Justice Dan Kelly. Former Justice Daniel Kelly, welcome and thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much for having me on, I appreciate it. This is the most expensive state Supreme Court race in U.S. history, as you know that. Millions of dollars pouring in from outside and political groups supporting both sides and both candidates. Is this the way Supreme Court races should be conducted? You know, that's a great question. Um, it is the way that our Constitution provides for it, right? So from the beginning of our state, 1848, we've always had an elected judiciary. And now this experience this year, perhaps that'll lead the people of Wisconsin to think maybe there's a different way of doing it. Do you think there should be a different way? What, appointments, for example? Well, I'll say is this, there are strengths and weaknesses to each of the methods of doing this. So one of the things that I like about an elective judiciary is that it's a regular reminder of who your bosses are. So you, you run for election and you go out and you talk to the people of Wisconsin. Those are the bosses. Now, the other hand is that it tends to make it political. And this is not a political institution. The court is not a political branch of government. And so, you know, one of the things that I've talked about through this entire campaign is how important it is that we don't talk about politics. We don't talk about political issues because that's a job that is reserved uh, by the people through their constitution to, to the legislature. You say it's not a political institution. Why has this become such a political race? Yeah, um, a couple of reasons, I think. One, there are uh, two very competing judicial philosophies uh, at issue here. So there's mine, which is constitutionalism, which is the understanding of the authority that the people of Wisconsin have loaned to us is, um, is very narrow. So they tell us through the Constitution, we want you to do one thing, just one thing. Use existing law to decide the cases to come before the court, and nothing else. Then there's the other uh, idea out there, living constitutionalism. My opponent has recently said uh, publicly that she subscribes to that notion. And that idea is, uh, is the proposition that uh, society changes over time and constitutions don't unless they're amended. And therefore, the idea behind living constitutionalism is, well, the courts should take the authority, whether it's granted to them or not, to update the Constitution, to update the laws, and bring them into modern society. And I think that, that the problem there is that it's a complete rejection of the rule of law. I'm curious, what, is, what do you think is the most pressing issue before the court? The most pressing issue before the court is whether we're gonna follow the law. Um, and I mean that, I mean, it sounds a little tongue in cheek, but I mean that seriously. The state's abortion law will likely end up before the Supreme Court. Uh, I know that you have received the endorsements of Wisconsin Family Action, Wisconsin Right to Life, as well as Pro-Life Wisconsin. Why should voters think that you would do anything other than uphold the state's 1849 abortion? Plan? Yeah, a couple of reasons. One, it's the way I conduct my campaign. I've been talking about the role and the function of the court and how we don't have anything to do with politics or, or partisan decision making. We just apply the law that already exists. Um, two, 
uh, as you uh, as you know, I've already served the people of Wisconsin for several years as a Supreme Court justice. Is there a scenario where you could rule that the state's current law and, and the abortion ban is unenforceable? Sure. I mean, if there is a um, uh, so, for example, um, there's a case currently in the system. It's the one uh, brought by Attorney General Call. And uh, and in that case, and I looked at the pleadings uh, once. I don't know if they've changed since then, but when I looked at the pleadings, uh, the argument was that a 1985 law impliedly repealed the 1849 law. And so that will likely work its way to the Supreme Court. Now, the question there before the court will be, um, was there an implied uh, repeal? And that's a basic statutory uh, question, uh, kind of a question that the Supreme Court deals with frequently. And there's a way of analyzing that. And, um, and I've not done the analysis uh, on that question uh, at this point. But if the analysis reveals that the 1985 statute impliedly repealed the 1849 statute, I'll say that. You've been highly critical of Judge uh, Protese Witz, your opponent uh, on the campaign trail, even during this interview on her sharing her values on the topic of abortion. You have previously expressed some of your opposition to abortion as, as well in previous writings. How is that any different? So the difference is this. Uh, I know the difference between the court and the legislature, and I'm not sure my opponent does. So if she knew the difference, if she knew the, the stark difference between lawmaking, which takes place in the legislature, and law adjudicating, which takes place in the court, she wouldn't be talking about her politics. She'd be talking about what the courts do. During your time on the court, did you ever anger any conservatives or Republicans? Um, yes, I did. <laughs> Well, Robin Voss, uh, I hear uh, I hear from constantly uh, uh, in his public statements and whatnot. Uh, there is a you might remember the SEIU versus Voss case, uh, and it had to do with some uh, legislation that was adopted in I believe it was 2018, and uh, and in one uh, one particular aspect of that, they came before the court for review, were uh, some restrictions on the adoption of guidance documents by the executive branch. And so uh, the, uh, the legislation provided that it had to go through a clearance process, accept public input, and then use that to, uh, to modify the proposed uh, guidance documents and so on. So we took a look at that to see if that uh, was within the legislature's authority to do. And Justice Rebecca Bradley and I uh, uh, wrote an opinion in which we concluded that it was not, uh, that that was interfering with the executives authority, uh, something the people of Wisconsin have committed to the executive's discretion. And so uh, I, I understand that um, he was not happy with that. Hillary Clinton recently endorsed your opponent, Judge Janet Protus Sewich. Former President Trump endorsed you in, in 2020. Is he going to endorse you this cycle? I have no idea. Have you talked with him since announcing your campaign? I'm not. A at this point, would you welcome his endorsements? Well, here's the thing with endorsements. So uh, the endorsements I, uh, that I look for uh, are those that would, um, that would uh, establish what a Supreme Court justice properly does. So I'll accept any, uh, any endorsement that advances that idea. I don't know if an, uh, an endorsement from President Trump would advance that idea. I want to talk about your work in 2020, hired by the state Republican Party, the Republican Party of, of Wisconsin as a private attorney. Former Chairman Andrew Hitt told the January 6th committee he had some pretty extensive conversations with you uh, about the false electors plan. You said it more equated to about 30 minutes yeah. and, and a phone call. I'm curious, though, more broadly, why you agreed to advise the party on a plan to submit false electors claiming to be for President Trump. Well, uh, so let's uh, let's back up. So the extensive uh, conversations uh, I believe he testified were with his attorneys, plural. And he mentioned you. Yes. I'm one of them uh, because I was uh, they were one of my clients. Uh, but he went on in the testimony to talk about there is one call that we had on this question lasted about 30 minutes. Uh, and um, frankly, I was not uh, versed in this area of the law. And, uh, and as the testimony shows, I was not in the loop. Um, so it was just that one conversation, just a general conversation about the subject, and that was it. Broadly speaking, is, is that in the spirit of the Constitution and the effort to overturn election results? Well, I, uh, so I've talked about uh, the importance of following the Constitution, especially in electoral matters. And, um, you know, it's interesting that, uh, that there are some media reports 
that are suggesting that I was in the middle of this idea of bringing these uh, alternate slate of electors um, when the testimony is I was not even in the loop. Now, the, the, the really interesting thing to me is that I've been roundly criticized by some people for, uh, for not coming out and saying that there's some way of negating uh, the, uh, the election. Your opponent, Judge Protasiewicz, has said that she will recuse herself from any case involving the Democratic Party of Wisconsin uh, due to the money that they've you know, given to support this campaign. You have not said the same about the Republican Party of Wisconsin. Why not? Yeah, partly because uh, we're not accepting uh, contributions from the Republican Party the way that she is. What do you mean by that? I mean, the Democratic Party of Wisconsin is sending her millions of dollars just writing a check. We're not accepting any checks from the Republican Party. Now, they're doing some in-kind stuff. So the things that they, and it's kind of an oddity of the, the way the campaign finance laws are written. So they're doing things on their own. I want to talk about a lot of the TV ads that we're seeing that voters may be seeing right now, maybe making their decisions off of these ads. In a recent ad, your opponent implies that you're corrupt, that you can be bought. Uh, can you be bought? No, absolutely not. And, you know, and this is, uh, let me just, uh, I appreciate you bringing this up because this is infuriating, truly infuriating. Uh, this is supposed to be a judicial campaign. Ju judicial officers can truly be said to be made out of nothing but words, nothing but words. And the power of those words is entirely dependent on the integrity of the person saying or writing them and the probity of their analysis. And this, uh, this ad, it's just a lie and it's slanderous and it's disgusting. So here's what happened. Uh, so they're referring to the Zignego case, of course, and the issue there was um, uh, who has the authority to maintain voter rolls? Is it the uh, local clerks or is it the Wisconsin Election Commission? And uh, uh, that came to the, case, uh, to the court before the spring 2020 election. So I recused myself because the resolution of the case had the possibility of affecting an election in which I was a candidate. And so I recused. Uh, then the election comes and goes, and then the case comes back to us on, if I recall correctly, a petition for review. And uh, now, because the election is over, the case can no longer affect anything in which I have an interest. And so here's the key. I wrote a letter to the parties and I said, here's the reason why I recused. That reason no longer obtains. Does anyone have any objection to my participation in the case? And you know what? No one objected. So that's what actually happened. We're going to do a quick lightning round before we wrap up here. Quick, brief answers. All if, right. If, if you're Emphasis willing, on if the you're, brief. If I know. Willing, if you're willing. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Jennifer Doro quickly endorsed you after after she lost. Are we going to see her on the campaign trail before yes. Election Day? Yeah. Any more details? Uh, none yet. Uh, so it's a question of scheduling. So we got to work with her calendar. Uh, but she's been very gracious and generous uh, with her offer to help us uh, all the way through the election. What have you learned during this campaign? Uh, I have learned uh, that I wake up every morning to learn something new about me that just isn't true. Uh, and, uh, and I've learned that that is just a, an appalling thing and an appalling way to conduct a campaign. And I, um, and I call on my opponent to do better because this is disgusting. Why should people trust you? Well, because of the experience, uh, because I've served as their Supreme Court Justice already, and they can look at all the work that I did. What is one thing you respect about your opponent? Uh, public service. Um, you know, I think it's uh, uh, public service is an important component, being able to live together in society and peace and prospect of, uh, of prosperity. Former Justice Daniel Kelly, thank you and best of luck and safe travels on the campaign trail. Thanks so much. Really appreciate you having me. We appreciate former Justice Kelly's time during this busy campaign season speaking to us at John Ridley's No Studios in downtown Milwaukee. And now also at No Studios, we go on the record with Judge Janet Protasiewicz. Milwaukee County Judge Janet Protasiewicz, thank you so much for your time. Thank good, you. Good to see you. This is the most expensive state Supreme Court race in U.S. history. As you know, millions of dollars pouring in from right. outside groups, from political parties backing both candidates. Is this the way Supreme Court races should be conducted? Well, I'll tell you, Supreme Court races are very, very expensive, and it's hard to get our message out. But I'll also tell you this, ever since the United States Supreme Court and the Citizen United case allowed outside money and outside expenditures to come in, this is a system that we have to operate in. So yes, it's very expensive, but we're also having the ability 
to talk to people all over the state to make sure that our message comes out. And our message being, let's get away from the extremism. Let's get away from the partisanship. Let's come back to common sense. Let's come back to our core values. And so that's the message that we are, you know, really doing our best to get around the state. There have been some who have said this has gotten out of control with, with the spending and money, and we should appoint judges as opposed to elect them because this has turned into a political race. So what are your thoughts on that? You know, I think that there are some real drawbacks to appointing judges, and I'll tell you why. I've traveled this entire state for a year now, places that I had never been before and talked with people I would have never otherwise met. When I talk to people who tell me that they're passing down their family farm generation to generation, but they're concerned because of contaminants in the soil, that would have just been a dead theoretical you know, argument to me on paper if I hadn't actually met with the people. For a position that is not political, why do you think that this race has become so political? Well, this race has a number of issues that people are very, very interested in, but I really think the critical reason that this race has become so political is because my opponent is a political extremist. He's not a conservative, he's an extremist. He's a right-wing extremist. And I think that is why this race has gotten so political. I've been a common sense judge. I've been a common sense prosecutor. I have very strong values. I conduct myself according to those values. I'm running against a partisan operative, somebody who ran his last campaign out of the Republican Party headquarters, somebody who has taken Republican money, you know, Republican pay money, salary, over $100,000 recently was still being paid by the Republican Party after he announced his candidacy for this seat. But, 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 worse than all of that, quite frankly, worse than all of that, is he was intrinsically, intrinsically involved in the scheme for the fake electors in the state of Wisconsin. This isn't some mainstream guy. This isn't some normal conservative who wants to you know, read the law and apply the law and come to a real conclusion. This is an operative. I know we're going to get into some of those issues here in just a few minutes, yeah. but I do want to ask you, what do you think is the most important issue right now facing the court? I think the most important issue is integrity, common sense, change. That's what I hear people talk to me about. Of course, they have specific issues that they're interested in, but what everybody across the board is interested in is, hey, let's have some normal back on our Supreme Court. Judge, we're here because you declined our invitation to debate Justice Kelly in a live televised debate. You've declined other traditional debate invitations as well. I'm curious why. I'll tell you why. First of all, there's one of me. <laughs> Secondly, I'm working full time. Third, if it were my choice, I would debate Dan Kelly all day long, every day. But that's not my choice. I have to be at work in the courthouse every single day and I'm traveling the whole state. So we selected an interview that's going to be televised. We selected an interview that people are going to be able to watch. I should say not an interview, but a debate. And so that debate will be you know, readily available to the public. I don't know whether or not Dan Kelly's working or not, but I have a full-time job at the courthouse. I have people who have been waiting for sometimes, not even months, but a year to have their case heard. You know, we have a pandemic backlog. The state's abortion law is likely to end up before the Supreme Court. For the first time in its history, Emily's List endorsed a candidate in the state judicial race, which was you. Uh, you also earned the, uh, got the endorsement from Planned Parenthood. Both organizations want to overturn the state's 1849 abortion ban. Are you a part of that plan? No, and I have made it very, very clear to everybody who I've talked to that I have personal values one of my personal values is that a woman should have a right to choose and make her reproductive health care decisions. I hope that I have been equally as clear that I have no predetermined decision on how any case regarding the 1849 ban is going to turn out. When and if that litigation comes in front of our Supreme Court, a fair decision will be made that's rooted in the law and rooted in the Constitution. Is there a scenario then where you would rule against the argument that the state's ban is unenforceable? Of course. There's a scenario to rule for it. There's a scenario to rule against it. It's all going to depend on how the issue is framed, how it comes to the court, what the arguments are, what the briefs are, and then a determination will be made. I think it's really critical that the voters understand 
and know what the values of a candidate is, especially in a race such as this, a statewide Supreme Court race. Why hide behind a filmy little veil or curtain and say you're going to make your decisions based on the law and constitution? We could all say that. This is what I've done my entire career. Gone into a courtroom, regardless of what I think of a law, I apply that law. That's what I do. That's what you do as a judge. That's what I've done as a district attorney. That's what I've done as a judge. That's what I will continue to do. You've called the state's legislative maps rigged before in our conversations and on I the have. campaign trail. You've said you would enjoy taking a fresh look at, at them, perhaps. Is that a signal to people who don't like the maps to file a lawsuit if you win and how you would rule on those? It's not a signal, but it's one of the main issues that people talk to me about when I'm campaigning. You might be surprised. You know, I'm all over the state large areas, small areas, suburban areas, rural areas, I'm all over. The vocal, um, people's being so vocal about how disturbed they are by our maps is one of the reasons I talk about the maps. In your mind, does a fair map equate to more Democrats being elected? I think that what would happen is yes, I would think fair maps would equate to more Democrats being elected because look, Wisconsin's a battleground state. Our statewide races are very, very close. You know, Governor Evers won his race in 2018 by 1%, last time he won by what, 3%? Really close races, right? On that same ticket, you know, Ron Johnson won the United States Senate seat. Josh Call won. You know, the Republicans won the state treasurer seat. What does that tell you? That tells you that our races are very, very close. We're a battleground state. The seats can go any way. Then you take a look at that state assembly. You take a look at that state senate. Almost two thirds red. I mean, I don't think anybody can look at that and say, yeah, that's fair. You have said that you would recuse yourself from any case involving the Democratic Party of Wisconsin because of the money that they have either spent or fundraised on, on your behalf uh, during this campaign. Why not say the same for any case involving the maps or abortion, given your public comments? Or how is that different? I'll tell you why it's different. The Democratic Party of the state of Wisconsin has contributed significant amounts of money to my campaign. So if I would sit on a case where they're a litigant, could I still be fair? Probably, because that's what I'm trained to do. That's what I do. On the other hand, how would it look to the public? Voters are seeing a lot of television ads in, yes. in, in this race. As Milwaukee County Circuit Court judge reports have indicated, at least several instances as judge where you rejected a prosecutor's request for prison time, a stronger penalty than you gave, including cases of sexual assault of a minor. I'm curious why. I'll tell you this. I have sentenced not hundreds of people, probably not even thousands of people, probably well over 10,000 people. My opponent has sentenced zero people. So I think it's very, very easy for him, and I'm well aware that the Republican Party of the state of Wisconsin did an open records request. I support open records, but did an open records request for every single case that I have touched as a judge. I would say that certain sentences were cherry-picked. I can also tell you, I just spent three years handling sexual assault and homicide cases. Sexual assault and homicide cases. That is the most rigorous tour of duty on the Milwaukee County Circuit Court bench. Many judges only do it for a year. Many judges won't do it at all. Did it for three years, back to back, handling just those types of cases. If I were weak on crime, if I were light on crime, I would not have been handling those cases. Your opponent, former Justice uh, Kelly, has said that you are running, uh, quote, the most profoundly dishonest campaign he's ever seen and called it, another quote, beneath the dignity of a judicial race. Are you running a dishonest campaign? I'm running a completely, totally, 100 percent honest campaign. I think that my opponent is trying to hide from his extreme views, from some of the activities that he's been engaged in, you know, in his career, um, some of the um, you know, thoughts and practices that he has in place. We have been very, very careful with every single commercial and ad that we have run to make sure that it is 100% accurate. I have heard that he's upset about the case that we ran regarding the Zignagos and the recusal and unrecusal. Well, here we have this guy recusing himself from a case. Very shortly after, one of the parties <laughs> starts contributing money to his campaign, $20,000, and then he unrecuses himself. Those are the facts we're putting in front of the public. 
The public needs to know this guy's extreme and he's corrupt. He is not fit to be on the Supreme Court. We're gonna do a quick lightning round before oh, no. we get okay. you out of here. Quick answers, if you don't mind. You've received the endorsement from Hillary Clinton, videos from stars like Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Are we gonna see any of them on the campaign trail before election day? I don't know. And I think that you probably hear about those before I do. I don't know. <laughs> what have you learned during this campaign? I have learned how beautiful this state is and how deeply people care about this state. You know, like it can be a very cold, brisk, icy, snowy snowstorm in a small town in Wisconsin, and we have a library packed with people wanting to talk about this race. It's a beautiful thing what our state is doing here. It's a beautiful thing trying to preserve our democracy. Why should voters trust you? I have a career that's based on and steeped in integrity. You know, as an assistant district attorney for 25 years, as a judge, take a look at my endorsements. People don't lend their name easily to a person or to a campaign. Take a look at those endorsements. I mean, they are really a resounding badge of honor for me in this race. What's one thing you respect about your opponent? I respect anybody, seriously who gets out there and does what the two of us are doing. It's not easy. You are open for attack. It's exhausting. <laughs> you know, you don't get to see your family. Your life gets put on hold. I believe that he probably believes in, you know, what he is saying to the voters. And, you know, I give him credit for putting himself out there. Milwaukee County Judge Janet Protasiewicz, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Our thanks to Judge Protasiewicz, and we thank you for being with us tonight and much gratitude to our partners at John Ridley's No Studios in Milwaukee for hosting. You can see the entire interviews and other highlights right now on our 12 News app. Early voting is underway. Election day is Tuesday, April 4th. Cast your ballot, then join us that night on 12 News to see your vote count. Good night, everyone. Thanks for being with us.